na prihlášku do doktorského štúdia v, v Murmansku, z Ruska. Spýtal sa, že ako, na podmienky prijatia pôvodných kolegov. Ako prepustal Bíčkovi, že ty ho chceš vysokovať od vzdelania. Tak by tak odpísal viac na to. Ako napísal, napísal mne, že ako nebudeme ani odpovedať ja ti na dvere. Ako to sme... Vtedy je to proti vodinu. Čo sa? Vtedy je to proti... Vítek je šéf doktor, doktorského štúdia, tak som mu dal tú možnosť ako nejak odpovedať a odpovedal veľmi jasne. Good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, students of uh, our Faculty of Social Studies, uh, dear guests who are here visiting or following us online, uh, let me uh, welcome you warmly at this first uh, debate, uh, which is opening the series of debates on ongoing uh, Russian uh, dastardly and brutal assault on Ukraine. Uh, this afternoon, our guests will uh, cover uh, political, economic, and energy security aspects of the ongoing uh, crisis. In uh, next sessions, we will address other a very important relevant issue such as migration, etc. Uh, I hope that you will enjoy this uh, first round. You will have a number of stimulating questions on our speakers and uh, you will learn more in depth uh, issues and information about ongoing uh, crisis. Uh, I wish us all uh, some positive prospects uh, related to the ongoing crisis. For me, it would be as possible, as quick uh, defeat of the invading hordes of Russian Federation and its president and uh, fair trial of all the war criminals uh, led by Vladimir Putin in The Hague. Let's hope that we will see the day when it happens. 
Uh, Martin, let me pass uh, the floor on you as the moderator. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Welcome, everyone, to the first of three debates that are planned uh, on the Ukrainian crisis and the war in Ukraine. Welcome, everyone. Uh, with me today uh, are three experts, uh, and it is a debate. There have been questions, why, why is it a deba debate? Why isn't it a seminar or a lecture? Uh, because we want to be available to your questions. That's the point. So uh, we're going to shortly comment on some of the aspects of the Ukrainian crisis uh, and the war in Ukraine. Uh, that are not as followed by the media or that go deeper uh, than what you can and likely are uh, looking at through the media and then give the floor over to you so that we can interact and have an actual debate. Uh, so my name is Martin Hovancic. Uh, uh, I'm the head of the uh, bachelor program in international relations and European politics. Uh, with me is our uh, resident expert on uh, the European Union and everything eastwards of the European Union and the relations, which is Dr. Kuhinkova. Uh, our uh, economics expert, uh, Dr. Vladan Hodlak, and our energy security and energy policy expert, uh, Associate Professor Janosicka. Formalities over. <laughs> so, before we jump in, I'd like us to be on more or less the same page. Um, especially after this weekend, right? Uh, I suspect because you're here, you're interested in what's happening in the Ukraine. I suspect, therefore, you've been watching the news and you know uh, where we've moved on in the crisis during the weekend. Uh, but let's you know, get on the same page. Uh, Russian forces around Kiev are withdrawing, uh, which is very interesting for the negotiation position of both parties in the ongoing negotiations, which are still ongoing. The massacres uncovered in the places they have left uh, have left not only the West, but many other countries across the world uh, reeling from shock of something that we did not expect to once again witness in Europe in the 21st century. And uh, we have a role to play in the coming weeks, months, we shall see. Now, one of the roles uh, which we are to play, not only as private citizens, is also as citizens, uh, most of us, of the European Union, and the European Union as an institution that has to somehow adapt to playing a role which usually is paid by national states. Uh, with that, the news is, the most recent news is, that not only prime ministers and presidents of individual national countries are venturing to Kiev to show support, uh, but it is also presidents of EU institutions, including Ursula von der Leyen, um, Charles, Charles Michel. Uh, and on that, I would pass uh, the word over to, to Petra to tell us more about the EU role in this crisis, where it's evolving, what more can be done, and in what position the EU finds itself. So over to you, Petra. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a few words about the role of the European Union, of course, the history of relations between European Union and Russia on one side and also with Ukraine on the other side is quite long, yeah, even before, of course, 2014 and the outbreak of the first crisis in Ukraine. Uh, what we now see in connection with the European Union, which is often being underlined, is uh, something about the united position, yeah, that in contrast to the first reactions that were connected connected with the crisis in 2014 and the other uh, and, and the following years. Now the reaction of the European Union seems more decisive, maybe more united. Of course, when we look more in depth, we could see also uh, the um, uh, divisions yeah, that are uh, there among the member states also of the European Union. But uh, for the time being, it seems that at least also the representatives of the EU institutions like Ursula von der Leyen that was already mentioned here or Charles Michel or I think that also Joseph Borrell is preparing to visit uh, Kyiv seems uh, very decisive concerning the support of Ukraine also in connection with these uh, massacres yeah, that were revealed in Bucha. Uh, these representatives of the EU institutions uh, reacted quite quickly. 
uh, and uh, Ursula von der Leyen was speaking about maybe uh, assisting the investigation, sending maybe some experts also to Ukraine and uh, that maybe Europol and Eurojust can also assist somehow in this. Yeah, so of course uh, it's this kind of assistance and besides also of this uh, maybe uh, missile uh, or weapons assistance yeah, that is sent by the particular member states. But of course you probably also wanted to ask about maybe the future of relations between uh, Ukraine and European Union. Of course, we know that Ukraine uh, or uh, President Zelensky asked for something like a quicker procedure of maybe um, entering Ukraine into the European Union. Here, he of course met some mixed reactions yeah, when we spoke about this united position of uh, European Union. Here we can speak, of course, about certain divisions of uh, positions. Uh, it is also necessary maybe to realize how realistic in fact, yeah, is this maybe quick entering of Ukraine into European Union, as I already spoke about something like a history of mutual relations. Now Ukraine has the association agreement and the so-called deep uh, and comprehensive free trade agreement with uh, European Union, also Moldova and Georgia, are the other countries that have these closer relations, uh, trade and also political relations with the European Union that formed the so-called association trio. And even before yeah, the outbreak of this Ukrainian war, these countries actually asked for closer relations uh, with the European Union. Yeah? And now, of course, there is a question whether it is maybe possible to make something like a symbolic step or less symbolic and more realistic maybe step towards the European Union as a gesture. Of course, there are representatives of the EU countries, including also our Prime Minister Fiala, who speaks about the necessity of some kind of uh, more open approach towards Ukraine, uh, maybe in a symbolic way, uh, uh, giving Ukraine the candidate status or the, or the potential candidate status. It is also necessary to take into account, uh, into the account that there are differences in this. Yeah, uh, candidate state, yeah, like some states in uh, uh, Western Balkan, uh, like some Western Balkan countries, are states that are already considered to be able to negotiate. In fact, to start the negotiations with uh, uh, the European Union about future accession. On the other hand, the potential candidate states are considered still not to be maybe fully prepared for the entering into the European Union, like Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, or Kosovo. Yeah? So there can be maybe this possibility to make this um, symbolic step towards Ukraine and uh, give it uh, the potential candidate status. On the other hand, there is also a question what the real form of some close relations could be between Ukraine and European Union maybe after the conflict ends. Yeah, and also it will very much depend also, of course, on the devastation of the country. Yeah? We already uh, heard that there will be some uh, conference of donors. Yeah? So probably the European Union wants to engage also some other actors, some other possible donors to the assistance, financial assistance to Ukraine. So again, it is um, uh, visible yeah, that they realize that the devastation of the country will be massive. Yeah? And of course, there are certain possibilities, uh, certain scenarios, how to make, be make uh, the relations between European Union and Ukraine closer in the future yeah, with some sectoral cooperation or maybe some uh, enhanced uh, institutional cooperation. Yeah, so there are various possibilities, of course, various scenarios, but very much will also depend on the outcome of the conflict because it's still don't know what the country will look like yeah, after uh, some ceasefire or some uh, negotiations talks will be uh, in the end. Yeah, they are still ongoing and we don't know the results simply. Thank you, Petra. Mm -hmm. it, if you were to think about the, the major hurdles to Ukraine's accession to the European Union, now that you already mentioned some of the internal ones mm -hmm. uh, that exist. Uh, is there an external one? Uh, let's say why Russia would object to Ukraine's membership, for example, in the EU? Uh, the signals coming from Russia were quite mixed. Yeah. On one hand, we heard maybe from the spokesperson of uh, Kremlin, Mr. Peskov, that uh, Russia maybe needn't to be against, yeah, because uh, European Union is not a military organization. 
uh, not defense organization. On the other hand, there also came some comments uh, later on that probably Mr. Peskov didn't read uh, properly the uh, current primary law, yeah, which also includes the so-called mutual assistance in defense. But that's uh, another question, yeah, how, whether we can compare yeah, this rather weak maybe instrument yeah, that has been included into the EU primary law with uh, the recent uh, revision, the Lisbon Treaty revision with, for example, the Article 5 yeah, of North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Yeah, because, for example, in this mutual assistant defense, there is nothing that about the attack, military attack on one country is also the attack on the other countries of the European Union. Yeah? Uh, it is quite, quite maybe weaker, yeah? uh, we, more weaker, weakly uh, formed formulated than this Article 5. Yeah, so it is true, simply, that the European Union is not defense organization and military organization. On the other hand, yeah, uh, we can question yeah, whether this was serious yeah, when Mr. Peskov said that they wouldn't have no objections or not so many objections as in case of North Atlantic Alliance. Yeah. And also, of course, there is a question what will be the size maybe of area which will be controlled by Russia? Yeah, because uh, in case that Ukraine would be something like a divided country, non-stable country, then of course we can also speak about some hurdles and obstacles concerning its future integration with the European Union. And by the way, there are also some internal possible hurdles and obstacles in the EU itself. Yeah, because the EU would have to adopt, adapt uh, substantially concerning its financial instruments, its internal policies, its also maybe institutional structures. Uh, so, yeah, there are, there are question marks, definitely. Okay, thank you. Just, what kind of single signal does it send to the other candidate countries that are in, in Russia's sphere of influence, if we should possibly look at Georgia specifically? Mm. Yes, these countries, Georgia, both Georgia and Moldova, also asked for membership officially in the European Union. Of course, it's, it's especially Moldova, which is uh, also very much influenced with this conflict, with this massive influx of uh, refugees. Of course, uh, 300,000 of people came into country, which has 3 million people. Yeah. So it is also something which is quite uh, maybe significant for the European Union, how it can assist. Yeah, to the country which is not a member country of the European Union, but may have certain problems yeah, with coping with this situation. Now, uh, in Moldova, we have pro-European president, uh, Maya Sandu, and also pro-European oriented government, but this is uh, quite a short period of time as we have this arrangement actually in Moldova, because there were also times of uh, pro-Russian president, pro-Russian forces yeah, in, in government of uh, Moldova, and the country is still divided. Yeah? There are also many internal problems, maybe internal obstacles, yeah? internal divisions in the country itself. It has its separatistic area in Transnistria, also autonomous area in Gagauzia, which uh, sometimes is again, not in full accord with the pro-European uh, foreign policy orientation of Moldova. Yeah? And with this security situation, we will also see what will be the situation in the battlefield, simply. How maybe the Russian forces will go on the south of uh, Ukraine. Uh, there are you know, certain scenarios that they can even or want it to uh, reach Transnistria, maybe, where the uh, certain military presence of Russian troops is for many years, yeah, since the end of tra uh, Transnistrian conflict in 1990s. So again, the yeah, situation of these countries, um, including also Georgia, of course, is quite difficult. Thank you. Thank you, ver Thank you very much. Um, now, the EU obviously is an economic powerhouse, and uh, its activities expected or otherwise with uh, whatever remains uh, to be seen out as the outcome of the negotiations Clearly, the EU wants to play an economic role and has to be in a position to play it. Uh, so the big discussion right now, obviously, is about do we add more sanctions, do we don't not add more sanctions, and we could talk about the unity of the EU, uh, Petra, furthermore, in the discussion. The interesting question I have for you, Vladan, now is, uh, well, how much is the Russian economy reeling? Uh, the guesstimates, I would call them guesstimates currently, about whether the sanctions are or are not working are pinned to indexes such as uh, the ruble, how the ruble is standing vis-a-vis -vis the dollar or the performers of the stock exchange, etc. And it's relatively hard to read 
how the Russian economy is coping with the sanctions. So could you give us kind of your thoughts of what we should be looking at? All right. So first, we have to look at what is possible. What is possible? We have to make an assessment what is possible, what can be achieved by imposing these sanctions on Russia. And uh, to do that, we have to somehow uh, analyze the position of the Russian economy and its resilience and ability to overcome these, uh, these sanctions. And I would, uh, I would use it, I would use a two-prone approach. Uh, the first one I would, uh, first I would uh, focus on macro variables, and then I will talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit about micro variables, uh, which uh, might be, uh, which might be game changers. So the macro variables uh, here, the picture is rather bleak because the Russian economy is not that much dependent on the West. Uh, the Russian balance of trade is positive and has been positive and uh, has been growing for years, which means that more foreign currency is coming in Russia than flowing out of Russia, which means that they simply are and will be solvent in US dollars and other foreign currencies. So even, uh, so by, by not you know, constraining their exports of natural materials, which, compro which, co which uh, comprise most of their, much of the, most, most of their exports, uh, if you don't cut their uh, exports, then they will be able to make money abroad and therefore they will be able to uh, earn more dollars than they need for uh, their economy to function. Therefore, this macro perspective is not very, uh, not very encouraging. Um, this, uh, that, that may explain the reasons why, for example, the Russian rubble did not uh, became a real rubble. So they did not you know, uh, collapse, com uh, has, has not collapsed completely so far. Uh, simply because Russians, uh, there are, ca in terms of cash flow, uh, they simply every month they get they receive more foreign currencies than they spend so and they, and that's enough not only to uh, pay for everything they need to export from other countries such as India or China since we uh, since we limited our exports so they have to get it some, from somewhere else such as China or India uh, so this not it's not enough for, only for this but it is only uh, but it's also enough for them to repay their old debts so therefore they have a positive cash flow. By financial means, it, you can make it difficult for them. You can like, make it uh, more complicated for them, uh, but still they have, uh, in, as a matter of, uh, as a matter of you know, macroeconomics, uh, they, have, they have enough cash flow to, uh, to overcome the crisis. So, and they, they, and the problem, the potential problem was a panic, but they were able uh, to prevent panic from happening by several administrative uh, measures, such as uh, the, the, one of the measures was that the, the exporters are required to, uh, to basically uh, give 80% of their export incomes to the government, or that uh, people having uh, accounts uh, in Russian banks denominated in dollars can uh, withdraw only can withdraw only five thousand uh, dollars in dollars, and the rest, the U.S. dollars, and the rest can be withdrawn only in Russian rubles. And Russian, Russian, the Russian central bank can create as many rubles, as much rubles as they want, because it's their national currency. So it's like it's they have unlimited amounts of rubles if they want. So for for this reason, mac the macro perspective is not very encouraging. But, but. The micro perspective is very different uh, because uh, Russian, the Russian economy is very much dependent on the Western uh, technology, on Western technology, machinery components, and so on. And uh, it seems that the Russians are uh, aware of it, and they have been trying to reorient their, uh, you know, uh, reorient their uh, purchases from uh, of this equipment and machinery from Europe to China. And they have been somewhat successful in that, in that, but only to a limited degree. And many of their, even their, for example, their, their rail, railroad system, railroad uh, system is uh, railways, they are dependent on Western technology. So this is one of the first signs that 
uh, when you can see that things are not going well for Russia when their uh, railroads start collapsing because they have they, they won't have enough you know uh, car they enough car enough uh, engines and so on uh, locomotives that would that would uh, that would that, are, that they need to run and to you know to run to keep the system running uh, in operation so and this uh, pertains or this is this holds true for many sectors of the Russian economy uh, many manufacturing plants uh, are dependent on Western technology. Uh, even even things such as uh, you know oil drilling facilities, uh, they are dependent on refinery and uh, that are dependent on Western technology. R yes, it's true that Russia has plenty of uh, natural resources, but a lot of them are beyond their technological capacity. They cannot get them from the Arctic because simply they don't have technology to drill them out. Uh, and for, the, for that, they need uh, the Western technology. They used to have Soviet technology, and it was good enough for these purposes, but simply they, they lost it over the th several decades. They are, now, they are not able to, uh, to basically even put all, those, all the old Soviet factories into operation because they partially lost the capacity to do so uh, because of this neglection. They neglected a lot of it. The, it, has to do a lot, it has a lot to do with, for example, with the setup of the Russian society. Uh, during the Soviet Union, uh, to be an engineer was a prestigious job. Today in Russia, not so much. Therefore, people are then. Therefore, people are not that much uh, interested in in this job, and therefore you lose you lose uh, these qualified people, and there is a brain drain from Russia for these reasons. So, from the macro perspective, you won't see that much. From micro perspective, you will see small cracks. Like, for example, I have there are rumors of Ural Wagon Zavod factory not being uh, not in operation being unable to you know uh, to produce any tanks for at least several weeks now because they lack uh, because they lack uh, western uh, machinery parts and so on uh, which means that uh, this can this can accumulate this can accumulate throughout the russian economy which may lead to massive problems the question is are the russians able to replace these components with uh, and technology with the Chinese uh, components and technology and Indian. Uh, nobody really speaks about India, but actually India plays quite a significant role as well because uh, they do business as, as usual with, with the Russians, so they haven't imposed any sanctions and they are quite important partner for Russia as well. So where I see the potential is in what we have already done, but it takes time to materialize. Uh, manufacturing, uh, the, uh, machinery, uh, technologies, and so on. This is really significant for the Russian economy, and the, cre the cracks have already started to appear, and I think that they will grow uh, in significance over time. Okay, so macro against micro is also a question of short-term versus long-term. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Significantly so. Um, again, so that we don't just focus internally, but also look uh, externally, uh, you already mentioned India, you mentioned China, uh, but is there a gap left by Russia in the world economy? Now we've talked about, or, or the media talks about, obviously wheat, uh, talks about potash, uh, fertilizers, etc. Yes. Uh, before we even touch fossil, uh, fossil products. Uh, how is the world economy coping with this? Because it was rather alarmist, uh, and it has stayed rather alarmist, uh, although you know, some conservative sources are saying it's really not that bad. So where are we standing specifically? Uh, some of the products that you mentioned, you've mentioned uh, have this uh, very nasty uh, quality uh, that... Uh, that, that they are very difficult to substitute. And even a small reduction in quantity causes a massive change in price. And they are, in, in, uh, they, they are uh, the, so we can use this term pri price uh, inelasticity. inelasticity. They, are not, they are inelastic, which means very small reduction in quantity causes massive changes in prices. Oil is one of them, but, the, but uh, uh, 
staple food, for example, uh, is, is another. And the uh, thing that I would be worried the most is probably wheat, uh, because Russia is the, uh, the largest exporter of wheat in the world, and Ukraine is, I think, the fourth one. I'm not sure, probably. So all together, they, uh, they account for a massive, chart, uh, massive, sh massive share of uh, world wheat exports and they export wheat to very uh, problematic regions of the world, I would say. So Egypt, for example, uh, Jordan, uh, Turkey, uh, Libya, Tunisia, and other countries. Uh, so here only, so here significant increases in price, which are likely of staple of staple food, uh, might cause political upheaval which might be really problematic for the European Union and for us as well. But I don't, I'm not sure uh, how much are we able to replace the Russian and Ukrainian production because, uh, and this is probably a question for Petra, uh, because uh, European Union has uh, for a long time has had pr problems with uh, uh, overproduction. Of, uh, of certain, you know, uh, commodity, food, food, and so on, it's types of, of food, the crops, and other other things. Uh, so we might be able to step in, but I'm not sure if we are able to do it over one year period. So there is a hope, and I think we can manage this by replacing the, uh, especially, the Ukraine exports, Ukraine, because Ukrainians won't be able. Uh, the Russian exports, we will see how how that goes, uh, but. The pro most problematic part is that it will create political instability in countries that are our neighbors, in meaning European Union, which may cause another crisis, migration crisis and, uh, in Europe, which might be problematic from the internal point of view, internal politics. But I think we can manage if the European Union really mobilizes its resources and, re and, and I think that we can replace these. So this, may be, this, is, this might be the most pro problematic part. Uh, but I think it's uh, manageable. Okay, thank you very much. Political instability, so where do we go from the role of the EU and the role of sanctions? Of course, it's gonna be oil and gas. Uh, where else would we go? <laughs> uh, the question about sanctioning oil, gas, and coal, by the way, coal is today uh, the actual commodity being discussed by the uh, European Union. Uh, Jan, uh, my, my question is, uh, over to you. Uh, now, Russia, with its uh, presidential decree, has started a game of chicken, essentially, uh, with European firms, states, having to pay uh, in ruble currencies for their gas and oil imports. Uh, we have refused to do so, uh, and I think that started a clock, uh, likely, on who's going to be the first one to blink, uh, who's the first one to willing to escalate to manipulating either the price or the actual deliveries of oil and gas. So where do you see that evolving? Uh, is it really a game of chicken or not? Uh, this is a fairly interesting moment right now, but over the scope of the whole crisis, this would be a rather minor thing in this. Um, maybe the most important thing to acknowledge is that um, there are firm and binding contracts between the European corporations and the Russian exporter, Gazprom, and the government so far are not at war with each other, and they, especially on the European side, do not push the companies to do things, right? Um, so, and the contracts that are there in place, they oblige uh, the two parties, the European energy companies and Gazprom, to behave certain way. And if you want to change what's in the contract, you have to agree both parts on what the change is going to be, or you have to bring it to the court and present your case for the change. So if Gazprom wants its payment in rubles, I understand why they want to have that. Um, it's going to increase demand for rubles and in, uh, help currency appreciate. So that makes perfect sense. But there's, no, there's not a way how you can force the Europeans to do that because that would shift um, the risk, the exchange rate risk towards the European consumers and they, it's a clear disadvantage for them. So nobody in Europe would agree to that. 
Um, and there are no means how Gazprom can push that agenda aside, just cutting off supply, which would be a massive breach of that contract, and then they will be sued, and they would be required to pay the damages you know, caused by the decision. Whether they would pay that or not, that's another question, but it would be fairly high at that escalation ladder. So I think that um, it made sense for them to try that, but at the same time, the likelihood of that proposal to succeed was like 0% from the very beginning, because clearly the European customers said, no, thank you, we're not going to do that, and you can't really request us to do that, because you know there's a contract that states that. If you have a problem with that contract, bring it to the court, and we can talk about it there. Or if you really want to open the contract, we can talk about other things too. Like uh, we are obliged to, for example, offtake certain amount of gas over extended period of time, maybe next 10, 15 years, and we might as well get rid of that obligation so we can cut you off without any financial repercussions. That would be nice for us to have. So if you want, we can exchange that for the ruble payment, but we are not sure that this is something that you would like to have. Right? So, um, what we see now is the situation coming down with that like mixed proposal. You can still pay with euros, but we will pretend we are accepting rubles, but this doesn't have really any effect whatsoever on the defining features of the trade. But it was a nice story, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we can definitely talk about, and, and that will be talked about in the, in the third of these debates, where we'll talk about disinformation. Uh, and the use of propaganda at home. Definitely this was a, a, a very important tool for, for Putin internally, for Russia. Uh, but what about Europe? I mean, this is always and has always been on the table uh, of us ceasing to uh, import gas and oil from the Russian Federation. Uh, now, multiple okay. countries are uh, resistant to that idea, still resistant, uh, but after this weekend, specifically, uh, the calls are much stronger. Uh, how do you see that evolving? How do I see what specifically? Whether, whether we will or will not cease uh, fossil fuel imports from the Russian Federation. Uh, and I'm not asking you to you know, <laughs> tell the future, uh, but yeah. what are the components that have to fall in place for that to happen? Uh, there's only one variable in this, and that's uh, the brutality of the war. So if it becomes ethically unacceptable to continue sending money to Russia, we will eventually work harder on getting rid of, of the fossil fuel supply. Um, there's probably nothing else that, that can move that forward. Um, there's one other thing maybe, and that's um, always when, or any time when such situation um, emerged in the, in, in the history, it is always accompanied by extreme price spikes, as we see now that the prices of gas are just through the roof. They are, or at, at one point, they were equivalent of maybe $360 per barrel if we spoke oil and gas energy parity. So imagine what we would do if oil costs $360 per barrel. That would be equal to, I don't know how much euros per liter, but obviously people would just start biking only, probably. Uh, it wouldn't be that bad, I guess. Um, but um, the, uh, the, the effect of such a price increase is that uh, companies, households, and industries tend to switch away from what is expensive and undermines their competitiveness to anything else. So we will see a major push towards energy efficiency measures, towards uh, renewable energy, uh, towards basically anything else uh, the price of which isn't driven by, by Russian gas supply, which would be hard in Europe uh, because electricity price is driven by the price of gas, for example, um, and therefore also Russian gas. Um, but we, see, we will see a clear push for, uh, for renewable technologies and non-fossil non technologies in general. So I assume that uh, we will see the, the more brutal Russia will be in Ukraine, the more pressure we will see on moving away from Russian gas and moving towards something else. And now the question is, 
what this something else would be, how much will it cost, and what it will do to our climate policies. So the social policy and the climate policy repercussions are the biggest question of the midterm and long term of the situation that we are now in. Thank you. M maybe one more for, for you and, and Vlad and equally is uh, the recent discussion after this weekend where brutality perhaps has reached that threshold where uh, we might be thinking of taking these measures in our, in our relations with the Russian Federation uh, is a lot of countries or there's a vocal minority of countries, uh, but very significant countries arguing that this step, uh, you know, ceasing fossil fuel imports from the Russian Federation uh, will cost us much more than the Russian Federation and there, therefore is a step that defeats itself. Would that estimation be correct? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> We're very efficient. Why is it such a big disparity if especially we take in not just the very short term where, of course, the price will spike, but over a longer period of time? Uh, well, we have discussed that a little bit um, already, but Russia has already has amassed quite large amount of reserves. And in this season only, in this, during this heat and season only, uh, due to the price spikes in natural gas that dates back to October, 2021, they, they earned as much money from selling gas only as they earned in previous 15 years. So they, they are flooded with cash right now and they have nothing to spend it for, right? They are not going to buy stuff from Europe anymore. Um, so, and they are self-sufficient in food and most of production that they really need, obviously. Um, taking into account what Vladan just said. Um, but we don't really get around to replace our energy supply with anything else, and the prices of energy are just, um, everything else is tied to the prices of energy. So we are already in a problem since fall 2021, but the war just made it, exacerbated heavily. Um, so we will pay a huge economic um, costs already, that's, that's for sure. Uh, we will see how this will be felt by European societies down the road because the social policy consequences are not felt immediately. We wouldn't feel it tomorrow, next week, but we will see businesses going uh, bankrupt, we will see people falling into energy poverty, we will see radicalization, frustration, all sorts of things that we know that inevitably come after such crisis. This is, this is already what is ahead of us, I can tell, I, I can foresee that, but we can, we can limit or we can change or affect how big of a problem this is going to be. Well then, you have something to add? I, I agree with that. Uh, there is one more thing that I would like to add, and that is, again, uh, you know, uh, going back to that uh, remark that I had uh, regarding the wheat exports. Uh, wheat and uh, oil are, behave similarly, and, uh, th and we can somehow you know, get around it, uh, we can survive it, uh, we, can, we will suffer, but our societies are, are rich. Uh, oil price that is, you know, that triples, for example, uh, it's unbearable for most of Africa and Asia. For us, it's like manageable, but for most Africa, it's completely like you know they won't be able to pay for that. So again, we have 1990s, 19 and 1980s uh, massive de to, uh, developing countries crisis, defaulting on their debts, and IMF massive, massive mobilization of funds through the International Monetary Fund to save these countries because they won't be able uh, to pay for their exports and basically to maintain their population, uh, basically, you know, uh, and they maintain some reasonable standard of living for their population. Uh, the point is that the inflation, the, the inflation that we have been suffering from so far is, usually, is mostly driven by resources, by gas, by oil, by lack of cer certain natural resources. The Russians, 
uh, also suffer in, from inflation, but their inflation is mostly due to devaluation of the Russian ruble. But all the drivers that we, that we you know, suffer from, that the, all those things that drive the inflation here in Europe, are absent in Russia because they can basically they can set the price within some certain parameters of oil and food for domestic Russian consumers. They don't import oil, so the oil price is up for their choosing, up to their choosing. They don't import most food, or at least staple crops. So this is again something that government can somehow manage. What is problem again? Uh, again, the most important problem uh, are the by far the, the most serious problem are the technologies and the spare parts and the machinery, which means that the Russian economy can literally break down because of infrastructure problems and so on. Uh, so communication problems and all these things uh, can can really uh, can really uh, deteriorate the position of Russian economy. And the question is how do are the Chinese able and willing to step in? Uh, I am not sure. I'm not sure because the Chinese play their own game. Uh, so I think there is a hope and I think that the sanctions are working. Come on, like seriously, the sanctions are, the sanctions are working because the Russian economy is, has been slowly you know, slowing down uh, because of these sanctions, especially because of technologies and so on. Remember, uh, realize one thing. The spare parts, you need the spare parts, but uh, only after several months. So the Russian trains will be running, then they will cannibalize some parts of those trains for other trains to operate, and then finally they will run out of those spare parts, so the Russian trains will stop operating. But it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to happen in half a year or one year or something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jan, you mentioned that uh, the Russian economy is, is flush with cash. Now, most of the trade, if I'm correct, in natural gas and oil is done in U.S. dollars. Uh, the U.S. has added to the sanctions on the central bank as well their inability to pay their debts in U.S. dollars very recently. Uh, so is a large amount held in currencies that basically give Russia a free hand to continue or is a significant amount held in U.S. dollars which would then help build pressure just like uh, Vladan just explained? Um, well, part of it goes in dollars, part of it goes in euros. Um, but I say um, that um, this 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 really depends on what the uh, on what the next moves would be, and how how these payments would fit into the into the existing scheme of the sanctions. So I can I can't tell really right now how this would go. Maybe Vladan could I comment can on add that. Something yeah. to that. I can add something to that. Uh, most of these most of these dollars are held on the accounts of the American or uh, European banks, mostly American banks. So for example. If the Russian central bank wants to make a payment in U.S. dollars, they have a correspondent bank, which I think is Morgan Stanley or J.P. Morgan. I, some, some, some American bank, I think J.P. Morgan. Uh, so they have an account uh, in J.P. Morgan that is denominated in dollars, and that's the, the account of the Russian central bank. And they, may pay, they make payment through this, uh, through this bank. It's called correspondent bank. So they can freeze all those assets, and suddenly all these U.S. dollars become inaccessible. We can do that, and we have been doing that more and more. Uh, yesterday, more and more extensively. Uh, I think today, the Russian, uh, the the American, uh, the American um, Ministry of Finance, the, the Department of Finance, uh, forbade J.P. Morgan from. Uh, from uh, doing these operations. So the Russians basically uh, might become technically insolvent. Uh, technically, they have the money, they just won't be able to use the money because of administrative you know, uh, prohibitions. Uh, so they are vulnerable in this. Uh, so we can, you know, uh, we can, uh, we can freeze all these dollars denominated uh, assets, and we can cut, cut them off uh, the, the Western financial system. We haven't done that so far. 
there are some there are there have been some targeted uh, sanctions on some Russian banks, and those they were uh, they cannot use the SWIFT messaging system within banks and so on. But uh, we haven't done that completely so far. So we can do that, and that will definitely hurt and somehow diminish their ability to wage war. There are two problems, one minor and one little bit more significant. The relatively minor one is that there are creditors who will basically uh, lose their investments, and these are Western creditors. So many companies in the West will lose their money because the Russians, not because the Russians don't want to pay or cannot or are not, don't, don't have enough money to pay, but because your government will make it impossible for them to pay. So this might, but I think this is relatively minor. There, there probably will have to be some compensation, probably, we will see, but, uh, but this is relatively minor, uh, minor thing. We can do that. What is more problematic is, again, the macro perspective. Russians still earn more than they pay, meaning in international trade. So they just need uh, a technical means how to, you know, how to run the system, how to, uh, how to basically pay for those, uh, for those imports and, uh, and uh, get paid by, for, the, for, the, for the imports, for the ex Russian exports. They can do this using uh, Chinese system, the Chinese system, the Chinese banks. Uh, so it, this is a technical matter, uh, but it would be uh, like it would, again. It would be it would add some more sand to the Russian economic machine. So it would make things more complicated, which might help. Uh, th is there a way around it? Yes, there is using the Chinese system, uh, the Chinese banks, uh, and denominate all the all the trade in other currencies. The point is. The point is not that you get some, you know, U.S. paper that it's called U.S. dollar, you know, uh, Uncle Sam's money. Uh, you don't need that. You need the machinery that comes for that. And you can get it for yuan, for example, but you have to have a system in place. The system is rather rudimentary, but it, there is one. So there is a possibility the Russians can get around it. But again, the Chinese have to help. I don't know. This is one of the most mysterious things. This has been the, one of the most mysterious things. The level of economic assistance of the, from China to Russia. I have been trying to find some information about it, but it's really difficult to find. For good reason, of course, obviously. But I don't know. I'm sure. I, I regret that, that I cannot tell you anything better, but simply the, the Chinese keep it secret, and I, I, I don't have any information, any, you know, uh, any people in Russia, in, in China that would, uh, and whistleblowers that would tell me. Okay, well, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we don't want to keep any more of our secrets, so over to you for the first round of questions. Uh, there's a mac microphone over here, so please just raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, we'll take kind of three or, or a couple questions up high so that we can we can see you uh, and then I have Ines and and up top in the in the blue sweater go ahead please is it working okay uh, thank you Vladan so uh, speaking about the technology could it be cryptocurrency the yuan that was developed for the Olympic Games for instance thank you what uh, about cryptocurrency uh, exactly. What about the, the cryptocurrency? What's the point of? Uh... If Russians can use it, uh, for instance, to buy oh, yeah, the yeah, UI can, for, they uh, can for use it. Yes. But they can use it. But uh, the point is that the Russian state is very suspicious of anything that it cannot control, and they cannot control cryptocurrencies. So uh, it creates, an, it creates an internal link. So there is, it's an internal link that people may use to uh, exchange, uh, to get, you know, uh, to get rid of rebels or to uh, create more pressure, pr pressure on the Russian rubble. Therefore, the Russian government is not very keen on uh, these uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, technically, maybe yes, but still, you would probably need, for the most part, you need US dollars to, to, uh, to trade in crypto. And uh, so you first you will have to get your hand on U.S. dollars, which is very difficult in Russia. Yes, the Russians can. The Russian, in theory, yes. But again, it's very unlikely because 
for what do you need this money? You need it to pay for real stuff, machinery. For example, in China, for Chinese machinery equipment. Now the Chinese are one of the, the Chinese government is one of the more restrictive uh, government re uh, with regard to uh, cryptocurrencies. So they won't accept cryptocurrency for uh, goods. Excuse me. Salaries in electronic yuans. Yeah, yeah, electronic yuans. Yes, I will. Yeah, okay. You, I thought that you were talking about Bitcoin. Ele you mean if you mean electronic currency uh, in in that is state run, that of course yes. But it's uh, it does. It's not a game changer. It's very similar to having just normal yuan or electronic yuan. Uh, it's it make things. It might make things a little bit easier. Uh, smoother operations, but the essence still remains the same. They would be able to do it even without the yuan, the electronic yuan. They are able to manage the payments, so it doesn't it doesn't change the the essence of the game. Go ahead, yes, please. Hi. Oh gosh. Oh, that's very loud. Okay. Um, so my question it's a little bit loaded and very big, um, but in a summary way. Uh, how would you evaluate um, the role of NATO in the conflict and their response to the conflict? Um, not only as the conflict started, but maybe also as a, a chess piece that was in place to enable the conflict or not. Um, and at the end of the day, my question is like, how do you evaluate the role of NATO in the conflict? If it should be expanded, if, if, sh if it should be reduced, if it's like the proper response, or if there should be uh, another take? Loaded question. <laughs> it is a loaded question, since if you're asking whether it should, it's, you're inevitably going to get a personal opinion <laughs> uh, to that answer. Uh, uh, yeah, Maybe I will try to answer, first. answer it. The role of NATO, yeah. you can see that, of course, NATO as an organization, also the member states of NATO are quite cautious to be directly involved in the conflict. On the other hand, before the Ukrainian war broke out, yeah, you could see that uh, Russian President Putin uh, very much maybe militarized the whole question concerning Ukraine and also its relations towards the West, and he uh, practically wanted to negotiate with the members of NATO, with the NATO as organization, and of course with the representatives of the United States, with the uh, American president. He avoided, almost completely avoided the European Union, actually. Yeah? Also the representatives of the European Union, as if yeah, this uh, pre-conflict uh, era wasn't uh, about also the relations, maybe previous relations between European Union and Russia. Yeah? So you can see that uh, uh, NATO was, to a certain extent, of course, involved in all of these uh, also diplomatic, uh, on this diplomatic uh, uh, level, yeah? but they are very, very cautious to be directly involved, yeah? because there is a big fear, of course, that there could be something like a direct confrontation. Uh, you can see that uh, or hear that Russian representatives are threatening very very much with the usage of nuclear weapons. Of course, we can also ask what kind, uh, it is a kind of tactique, yeah, how seriously they are in uh, uh, using something like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would say yeah, that uh, NATO is involved, of course, but very, very much cautious not to be involved directly. Yeah. And of course, there was this question of uh, membership of Ukraine in NATO, of course. Yeah. Uh, now we can see that President Zelensky is openly saying that he can live without the idea of uh, uh, direct membership of Ukraine in NATO. Uh, of course, there is a question whether a compensation for this couldn't be these uh, closer relations with the European Union. We already spoke about it, that the European Union also has certain mutual assistance clauses and something like that. Yeah. Uh, and of course, there is a question of some guarantees, security guarantees that would be made outside of NATO by some other other countries to replace maybe this guarantee which was to be connected with uh, Ukrainian membership in NATO. Yeah? But I see NATO position as quite cautious. If anyone else wants to I'd actually like say to something. answer Inez on, uh, and, and then there's the, the blue sweater up, up top has the next, next question. Uh, 
on the role of NATO prior to the start of the conflict, which is the major narrative that NATO, in fact, uh, in many parts of the world, uh, especially Asia, uh, that NATO, in fact, drove this conflict by its eastward expansion. Uh, if you can go back and think about 2011, 2012, 2013, so prior to the 2014 crisis of Ukraine, uh, yes, NATO was expanding uh, eastwards, but Russia was not on the radar. It, w it wasn't you know, that wasn't topic number one in NATO at that time at all. It was a bit more after 2008, right? Uh, but it was much less than after 2014. And if you looked at the distribution of troops within NATO in those periods, they were nowhere near the Eastern front lines. Uh, so by exactly what Petra said, uh, the Russian Federation making it ever more a military discussion, a hard security discussion, a hard security threat of NATO's expansion. Did NATO slowly have to react to that? And especially after the 2014 escalation is since 2014 up until now in those eight years, yes, NATO has become more fortified in its Eastern part, which could be taken as a threat. But then that was much more of a reaction than it was you know, a proactive expansion to the East. Uh, and to the question of whether it is playing a bigger role, um, in my opening notes, I, uh, other than the massacres that, that have been uncovered, I also had a note of how many more countries are willing to supply larger and more effective weapons to Ukraine. And those are NATO members uh, that are taking this step. So while, while it might not be NATO as such as an organization, there is essentially a sanctification of those steps by individual members, whether it's Poland or it's the Czech Republic, indeed, is sorry, currently sending the largest train. The train is probably somewhere in Slovakia right now uh, of T-72 tanks, of uh, infantry fighting vehicles, etc. So that escalation, indeed, from NATO is there. It's just not under the NATO umbrella. Okay, um, like while European Union like is sanctioning Russia, Russia is sanctioning us back, and at the same time like India can buy like oil like a discounted price, China can like have like now more gas from Russia since they're not like giving it to European Union. While we cannot trade with Russia, the rest of the world is continuing trading with them. Like European flight, can, commercial flight cannot go through Russia to go to the east. Asian commercial flights can go through Russia to come to the west. Or like all like all these factors might be like the end of the Western dominance over economy in favor of the East. Could this, could this war really be like the nail of the coffee, so coffin of the Western hegemony? That, that one's yours very clearly, Vlad. <laughs> Just say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, the point is that from Europe, we see things very differently. Uh, the U.S., in the U.S., this, this discussion is a little bit different, and they are very much aware that the number one threat is China and not the old drunken guy somewhere in the East with nuclear weapons. Uh, Russians are, like, they are... <laughs> They are diminishing force. They are like aging population. Economy is falling apart. So they are not interested in. The, in they are not interesting in the long term. They are like you no, know, really like not in the future. The Russians won't play any significant. They will play significant role, but much much lower than, than the smaller than they do now. So yes, the one who is benefiting from the crisis. Are, is, the, is, the, is Asia, especially the Chinese, India, and other countries in that region. Uh, the question is, can we do otherwise? Nah, I don't, I'm not sure that we can do otherwise, except for just following our, our recent path of development, because uh, Western Europe and the United States of America are still technologically more sophisticated. The technology is more sophisticated and is more advanced. Uh, the Chinese are not able to produce everything. They still need uh, Western components, especially the German ones and some American and some Japanese and Taiwanese, but mostly the German. And uh, it's not that easy, uh, that easy gap to breach, so to, so to get to, to close. So uh, I think that 
Probably you are right, but the question is, can we do otherwise? Yes, India has, uh, has not voted for the resolution or within the Security Council, they abstained. Uh, no, people don't, people don't usually mention India. I think this is very important that, the, that in India is basically doing its own policy and which is basically uh, business as usual. They don't care for the most part. Uh, China and um, these countries, yes, they are benefiting from the crisis. I don't think that we can do otherwise. Maybe some of you have other opinions, but I, don't, I really don't know. But yeah, you might be right. Maybe I would add that it was already included in the Russian foreign policy doctrine from 2013 that they actually supported and predicted something like a shift of uh, uh, the, um, uh, yeah, the world economy into the Asia Pacific uh, uh, area, but uh, they of course wanted to be in control of this process. And there's a question whether they are in control of this process or some other actors like China. Okay, thank you. So more hands up for questions. I know there was one up front here. And then we... Have you forgotten your question? There was a question here. No, that's fine. So we have the gentleman and then... Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, since it seems like Russia planned the invasion for quite a while now, um, are there... Is it maybe observable that they tried to stack up on spare parts that you were referring to, or did they already maybe had some deals with um, China, India? Because, like, I feel locomotives or uh, machinery like that uh, might not be too sophisticated for also other countries to uh, produce all that, so that even those micro uh, economic uh, sanctions or um, things that you refer to that uh, that might not play out as uh, we hope to. First, uh, there are several aspects to that. First, the first one is uh, it's still too early to tell. We don't know. Uh, still, the things might not have broken down yet. The second part is the uh, Russians have vast uh, stockpiles. They have stockpiles of old Soviet equipment. They can still use that. There are all T70, old T-72 tanks. There are thousands of them. They are in stores. They can just, you know, they can start, they can start the engine and go. But of course, the question is how many of them are operational? So some of them might be rotten. Uh, some of them might be operational and they have thousands of them. So this is not the kind of war that you use the most sophisticated weapons for. If you lose T-90s or T-72s, in your attacks, it doesn't matter that much. So they have plenty of old Soviet equipment. They won't run out of that for a long time. Uh, they might run out of people first, then they run out of this old Soviet equipment. But the, the last uh, thing that I think is very significant, and maybe Jan can tell you more about this, I'm not sure about how much sophisticated is their infrastructure. Uh, because you need infrastructure to actually first we import things from China, which we don't know how much the infrastructure in Far East has evolved. The second part is they have to pay for that because Chinese are not definitely not going to do it out of charity. You have to pay and it will pay a lot probably to the Chinese. And I don't know if the Russian capacity to uh, deliver natural gas and oil to China are robust enough, which maybe you know. I do. <laughs> um, right. So at the moment there is a there is a pipeline from Russia to China, but it's by far inadequate to replace the the European routes. So if if we were as Europe to hurt Russia somewhere, it would be cutting gas because they would have no means how to sell it anywhere else for quite some time until they develop the necessary infrastructure uh, to sell it either directly to China or liquefy it and sell it elsewhere in the world. But this would, as you correctly pointed out, require a lot of cash upfront and probably more importantly, a lot of time. 
With oil, it's a completely different story. Uh, you can't really deny anybody from selling oil. It's a globalized, integrated uh, market with oil. So what you just need is to have a, a sea terminal where you ship your oil and then rent independent company to ship it off to the world market and you're ready to go. So um, what we can do is, as Europe is get rid of gas as soon as possible because this would replace the card that the Russians can play against us and also deprive them of some real money. Uh, but we can't do much about oil. They would be continuing selling oil to anybody who would be interested in getting it. And we will be buying oil from somebody else who will replace them. That's not a big problem. Um, so as much as we are not vulnerable towards disruption in oil supply, the Russians are not vulnerable um, towards disruption in oil demand from our side. So if we really wanted to be as harsh as we can, we would just need to build up a electric car development program that would run through the whole world and replace all the internal combustion engine cars as fast as we can. That's the only way how you can defund the, uh, the Russian state, just make oil irrelevant. Um, this is a funny thing to discuss, but it is ahead of us. We can just make it a little bit faster. So the question is, do we want or do we don't want to do it? i just add that if your question was about stocking up on, you know, extra components for whatever, civilian aircraft, for example, or trains, etc., then very much the narrative that a long war wasn't that expected actually plays out true uh, because, uh, for example, civil aviation, right? Uh, the, the Russia leases a lot of planes, and Boeing has already said that they were not supplying, ex you know, those planes are serviced typically in, in Europe, or, or they would be elsewhere. Uh, the same is for trains. There's, there's a lot of technology, and Vladan is very correct in this, that is just serviced from outside, and nobody has indicated that there were large shipments you know, increasing shipments of extra parts previously to the engagement of the conflict. So that would in, indeed make your question highly relevant that, you know, there isn't, and that makes Vladan's commentary probably likely to appear sooner rather than later because there aren't stockpiled massive parts for everything that's nece necessary for civilian infrastructure. Uh, we had a question at the side. you just I have a question for you Jan though about what you were saying because you're saying not in the near like at some point that we if we stop relying on gas and I like timelines so realistically how long would it be that like I don't think the Czech Republic in the next five years ten years can say okay we don't need this anymore like we don't need gas so what is the timeline that you're actually talking about and then okay um so that's actually a function of two things. First, uh, how serious we get about that. And second, how willing are we to breach contracts? Uh, the second part is easier. There are binding contracts between European companies and Russian companies. So if we tell them our governments just breach it, don't offtake it, otherwise we sanction you and you're out of business then there will be some economic repercussions and our credibility repercussions and it would be relatively high on the escalation ladder of the economic warfare with Russia. So we might be cognizant of that before we, before we do it. And um, the crucial part is how seriously we, we go about that. Um, we can do it quite fast because there's a, there's a lot of competing technologies in energy industry. You don't have only gas, you have multiple other things that you can burn to get your heat. Um, so it is more a question, as I said before, a question of money, social policy consequences, economic policy consequences, and climate policy consequences. Um, if I were overly optimistic, I would say we can do it by next heating season. 
but it would require a nationwide mobilization, essentially like war kind of economy, you know, rolling out and like massively paid uh, construction companies, renovating buildings on like chessboard, chessboard manner across the whole Europe and all sorts of things. It wouldn't be like one silver bullet that you just apply and be okay with that. Um, it would need to be hundreds of smaller coordinated measures that would be profoundly expensive in aggregate. Not only on the European side, because part of it would be scrambling uh, the available natural gas from the world market, which would mean that we would make the price of energy for everybody very high and there would be huge developmental, economic and humanitarian consequences down the road in regions like Southeast Asia, Africa, uh, South America. But, you know, we are already there. Prices are already high. They can be much higher. We can feel it much stronger. Um, but this remains to be seen. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about international trade and if we speak about China and India and additional value, usually we buy from China and India, add value and sell. And this is how like Western civilization uh, got uh, tips. Uh, today, uh, we, uh, whether China and India will buy, I wonder whether China and India will buy some products uh, to avoid sanctions uh, for Russia and to sell for them, and which products it would be, just to gain additional value. I'm not sure that I understood correctly. Uh, so, your question is about uh, whether Chinese, the Chinese and Indians are able to avoid the sanctions in, the, in trade or? Uh, whether Russia can avoid sanctions with their help uh, buying products from the West for uh, some kind of they, they cannot. So mm -hmm. the Russians can replace some of the, uh, some of the goods and uh, some of the exports from the imports from the, uh, provided by the West of, uh, for, in, in India and China, definitely. Uh, I don't know how, I, I just, just, I'm not sure to what extent. I'm, I am not uh, an expert on China, unfortunately. So I cannot tell you whether the Chinese are able, how much are the Chinese able to substitute? Uh, how far they are, uh, how sophisticated they got? It seems that they got pretty, what? Like as a middleman. Okay, uh, no, <laughs> they cannot. You mean what the Indians and Chinese buy free in, in the West? <laughs> they cannot buy in the West and uh, re-export it to Russia because, because that would mean sanctions on those economies. What about luxury? Like if they buy, how, how we can control it? Uh, I guess it would be like an inquiry from Russia. The Russians, how the Russians, oh, again, how we will know, how we will know? Well, because, well, it's, okay, they can try to cheat, okay? They might cheat, but the, you cannot do it on any grand scale, because then you will find out. So, and if you need it for military purposes, you need thousands of those things. So it's not that easy to hide if, we, if, you, if you have to re-export thousands of pieces of that equipment. So it's, it's doable, but uh, I don't think that it's impossible to spot. And some ch technologies the Chinese don't have. Therefore, since they don't have the ch they, their own technology, it's going to be obviously Western technology. But yes, there is this possibility. I have a cousin of mine who works for an, uh, for an international company here, for, for, for a multinational company here in Brno, and they had to leave the, they produce microscopes, and they had to leave the Russian market, and, but uh, the, their, uh, their uh, partners in Russia, their, the, 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 the people who demand, the companies that demand, they buy their products, uh, got several offers from the Chinese uh, within one week to replace that. So I don't, but I am not sure how sophisticated the Chinese are, if it's fully replaceable and so on. But the Chinese are getting there really quickly. 
really quickly. I, but I'm not sure how far they are right now. Um, just if, if I may, if I may add to that, uh, I've just seen an investigation being uh, raised against Bosch, a German company, whose parts were found in one of the destroyed Russian military equipment, and they really shouldn't be there. So I guess when you do that, and the part gets recovered, and you can sort of get the, the, the ID number of that part, you can track who it was, by whom it was sold, to whom, and you can get that information that somebody was getting you know, around the sanctions, and then it can hit the company quite hard. So it depends on how the incentives are, uh, are set. I would also say that Monday is a lecture on international sanctions circumvention, so you're welcome to join that. Uh, does anybody have a Huawei phone? A phone from Huawei is going to be one person. You know what happened to Huawei when it circumvented U.S. sanctions? The company itself lost more than $14 billion. Uh, and there's one more factor in this. How big of a market is Russia for China and for India? Uh, are they worth losing access to Western markets? Because uh, the secondary sanctions that would get applied by the US immediately, by the EU likely, uh, very soon after China, Chinese companies, companies, individual companies, uh, would be found, yeah, another Huawei phone, uh, would be found to be in breach of the sanctions, whether after the fact, like Bosch, or, or during, the, um, during the actual exchange, is still a very, very high price to pay for Chinese company and Indian companies. So yes, some are rushing in, but uh, it's really not up to the scale that we would expect. Uh, we can see this in the market for cellular phones, for example, uh, where uh, the Russian market is just so small for Chinese producers who, who dominate the market, and then South Korea, is that they're not rushing in. They're actually, their phones are more expensive in Russia, and they're not, not trying to replace uh, everything by, these, uh, by substituting whatever left from the West, namely Apple. Uh, simply because of fear for secondary sanctions. So yes, there is a way, both of our colleagues are definitely right, and yes, this will be happening, but the grand scale of it is still limited and is very likely to be quite limited uh, into the future. So more questions, uh, we had something on top, yep, at the very top. Ask, yeah. Closer to your mouth and go yeah. ahead. I want to ask like one really simple thing. Like if like these sanctions which is like implemented able to stop the war? If the sanctions are able to stop the war? Yeah. Uh, no. So no. When the it, sanction is not it, able to stop the war, what is the point of putting those sanctions? It's increasing the cost of war where eventually this will work. Uh, can you can you stop a head-on attack by a military by any other means other than military? Okay. It's, it's sort of the same question. It's like we're using what is at our disposal uh, to the maximum and very quick level, and, and this is really a question to Petra as well of how quick and coordinated uh, the West and the European Union was and reaching this level of sanctions, which is essentially unprecedented, even when you take into account Iran and South, um, sorry, North Korea. So uh, can they stop the war over a longer period? Yes. If you're asking if what happened in Bucha is, is, is not going to happen again uh, because we've put in sanctions, is it's just the effects are much more long-term. Uh, and they add cost because you can project costs, okay. right? So you know what it's going to cost you down the line as a decision maker. And therefore, you can factor that in into choosing an option. Now, the best thing the sanctions do is constrain. That is not coerced to a very, you know, a diametric change of behavior, uh, a 100-degree shift, but they can constrain the options. And that's, in, in that, Vladan is exactly right. They definitely are constraining a large degree of options. And the more they're uh, impactful and the longer they're in place, the more they're going to constrain. But, but I have to ask one more thing. Is the European Union, people are ready to bear that cost, which is like cut off from the Russian gas? 
or the social benefit cost which is going to come in the form of taxes on the people which they are not watching it right now are they ready to pay for it each and every single of them yes you already spoke about or mentioned these uh, maybe social impacts and social effects of course also on the european union and the societies here yeah maybe i would also return to your original question yeah the question is whether we have any other maybe option if we don't want to go into direct military conflict with russia whether we have any other options than sanctions and the deliveries of weapons to ukraine yeah and we also spoke about maybe about certain psychological effects of the sanctions yeah about this unity maybe flexibility of European Union is still questionable of course whether we have enough flexibility in sanctions because there is still unanimity the unanimity is needed and of course when you are asking about these maybe social impacts yeah how the societies are able to to what extent they are able to admit yeah uh, that uh, they will have certain uh, difficult times or something like that here yeah we can also so of course pose a question whether there will be this unanimity whether we will keep it yeah because uh, there are already certain signals, of course, coming from certain countries. Uh, there were elections in Hungary, for example, and Hungary is questioning, of course, for a long time, this may be EU policy towards Russia. On the other hand, as also our prime minister underlined, uh, in fact, and officially, they are still keeping the line. Yeah, they are criticizing, but they are still keeping the line. Yeah? And there's also a question, what will be the position of some other countries? Yeah, some countries have more reserved position, also in Western Europe, like Germany, like the Netherlands, maybe towards these uh, sanctions that are connected, maybe with full stop of deliveries of gas and energy resources from Russia. There are more courageous countries, of course, Lithuania, for example, uh, stopped. Yeah? Lithuania or Latvia, it was some uh, yeah, Baltic country that stopped already the deliveries of Russian gas, yeah? So there, there is diversity, of course. There is diversity of the positions among the EU countries, and always depends also, of course, on the social costs, also on your historic experience, also how you see maybe the security and also geopolitical dimension of all these things. We can look at them purely with economic lenses and social lenses, but also some countries look at it primarily from the security and geopolitical position. Yeah, so maybe it's my, my answer to it. There's also a temporal dimension in this. Um, if you look at the past 30 years of Russian history, then Russia engaged, engages in a war maybe every five years or so. So should, I know we shouldn't extrapolate trends, but what if the trend was to continue? Would you be all right with sending Russia more money and technologies? Sorry, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't understand, sorry. Americans also have the same thing. There is no much difference. Okay. Like Afghanistan, <laughs> Syria, there are many in Africa, Civil violence, I, nobody talk about. I understand, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not really sure that if somebody wages a war, we should be in approval of another war, right? I don't think, this is, was, this is not what I was taught as a kid. <laughs> that if I see violence, I should engage in one too. I don't think we can really, you know, have that as an argument. Is that, uh, I definitely agree with you on that these sanctions prevent the next war because the Russians will simply won't have capacity to wage it. Uh, and it's, it's as clearly already shown in their inability to produce any sophisticated weaponry. The Chinese, the Chinese, the, the Indians have stopped the collaborations with the Russians uh, on their Su-57 project because the Russians are simply unable to, you know, to uh, fulfill the Indian demands because of these European sanctions. So I think, and their ability to produce sophisticated tanks, for example, uh, has you know, fall to zero, basically. So it seems that it did definitely at least preventing the future wars because the Russians won't have capacity to do it. Um. 
maybe I would add here yeah, that uh, it is also the question what were the original intentions of Russia in this conflict, in fact? Was it only about Ukraine? Or was it about the whole post Soviet area? Or was it also about those countries of Central and Eastern Europe that entered NATO in the end of 1990s at the beginning of new century? Yeah? Because the demands, the requests which Mr. Putin addressed to uh, North Atlantic Alliance also concerned these countries, in fact. Yeah? So uh, when uh, the guys speak about something like a prevention of next war, I think that in this context it makes sense. Okay, we'll, we'll move it on to uh, one, two, three. Check, check, Slovak. Hello. Hey, can we have more questions down here? You can, you can stick around. We can talk. We can now give the floor to other people too, and then we can talk about it. Yeah. Stick around and then, then, then see us later. Um, I have a question regarding uh, China. With uh, China being more and more powerful, uh, is it a risk that the EU or US won't be able to sanction China back if they are helping Russia to overcome the sanctions? Or how does they perceive these threats? Like what kind of leverage they can have on China? Uh, there is a clear distinction between the between the seriousness of the, of the issue in the European Union and in the United States of America. For the US, the China is a real threat to their dominance and they uh, understand it and they project this and they, uh, they reflect this in their strategies. In Europe, there is still much, Europe is still much more idealistic in this and they try to engage in trade without much uh, disruption, especially the Germans. Uh, but also other countries. So the threat is perceived differently in the US and in Europe. In Europe, very little. Uh, there, is some, there has been some change, but not that much. In the US, definitely, yes. So Chinese are happy about this distraction very much. Uh, there has been a trend to regionalization, economic regionalizations uh, recently. The Chinese are getting less and less uh, dependent on Western markets and technologies. And uh, we are uh, moving some of our industries back from China. So I think that uh, still we have our leverage is bigger. But I think that in the future, the more probable scenario is that the, the world economy will a little bit disintegrate, they, it will regionalize, and I still think that the West can outcompete Chinese. I still think that we, our social economic model can outcompete the Chinese one, therefore they need us more than we do them, but I might be of course wrong. I might be proven wrong, I hope I won't. Okay, thank you for the question. There's also one short-term aspect to it, and that's the, the U.S. has a history of secondary sanctions, while the EU does not. So there would be have, have to be a very good reason of what China has breached for the EU to decide to impose sanctions on China. And that would have to you know, impinge upon one of the core values uh, where currently we, we just don't have the practice of extraterritorial application of sanctions, what the U.S. does. So the U.S. would be war willing and has engaged that in that in, in practice in the past well, the EU has not. Uh, so, do we have more questions? Going once. Going twice. We're, guys, we're right at the one hour, 30 minute mark. So, it's now or never. Well, it's now or next week, essentially. <laughs> and there's one more question here. You have a great question, so don't worry. Uh, give us another one. I have a question to Petra. Petra, you said that uh, the uh, entering, Ukrainian entering of the EU depends on whether uh, the territory of Ukraine would be pardoned. 
Uh, we have this situation with Moldavia, with Georgia and Ukraine. You mentioned these uh, three countries who wanted to, to be closer to European Union, but all has problems with separated areas. This is like very um, spread scenario and it looks like uh, this is how Russia prevents other countries from stepping in. Uh, so does uh, this remark mean that um, Ukraine needs back Donbass and Crimea to be a part of European Union? Thank you. I think that it will depend very much on what may be the future form of, re of close relations and future form of may integration of these countries like Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia with the European Union can be. Yeah, because actually for a long time you can observe something which is called enlargement fatigue in the European Union. And this concerns not only, of course, countries that are not even candidate countries. These countries are members of the so-called neighborhood policy, uh, Eastern Partnership more precisely. But there are also candidate countries yeah, in Western Balkans and still their road towards the European Union is quite long. Uh, the whole process is very, very complicated. We have also Turkey, which is also a candidate to entering European Union for 20 years. And there are actually big questions. What to do with this situation? Yeah. Whether we shouldn't maybe search for some other models which wouldn't mean maybe full membership, full entering into institutions, uh, uh, but some other maybe model of differentiated integration which can be offered to countries, also to countries maybe like countries of Western Balkans, yeah? uh, maybe Turkey, maybe countries in post-Soviet area, whether we really should maybe make also these countries to do these difficult steps. Because if you say, yeah, we must gain Donbass, yeah, without this, uh, it is not possible maybe more integrate in the European Union. There were these complicated situations also with Cyprus, for example. Yeah? This, it was also a country with problems. Uh, uh, the the um, island is not compact. Yeah? There is this uh, northern part, which is not a part of Cyprus that entered the European Union. Yeah? So we can maybe think for the future about also some other models yeah, that can be made on uh, European economic area. These countries have deep and comprehensive free trade area with the European Union. It already means that they have to approximate maybe 80 or 90 percent of aquí communautaire, which is connected to its uh, internal market. So these countries are already integrating very much with the European Union. So if we will continue with this process and maybe allow these countries to enter into certain internal policies of the European Union, to um, enter them a road towards more funds, uh, EU funds, yeah? not only these um, instruments for neighborhood policy, but really real funds, internal funds that are financing certain internal policies of the European Union and find some other model of differentiated integration. We can maybe find some kind of compromise, yeah? but this is a question for the future. This should be compromised also on the side of the European Union, it should be compromised also on the side of these countries, yeah? that maybe full membership is quite difficult in short term uh, dimension, but there can be some other models. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you to all of you for joining us in this debate. Uh, be sure to check us out and meet us next week for the migration debate, uh, where obviously, yes, I, I see everyone's prepared for you for the migration debate. Uh, we'll be happy to engage with you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, enjoy your evening, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.